participate in Be Fearless and be involved in serving because you want to be a part of the revolution, right? <laughs> so you don't sound like it. So, uh, you know, we, you've got the opportunity to be generous. All of the money that you give through Fearless is going to these great organizations uh, that are already vetted. And then we want you to serve. So <laughs> do you want to be part of the revolution? Okay, so, you know, really the question is, do you want God to write a romance novel in your life and at the end of it, that's it, just, you know, pretty story, a lot of pink and stuff? Or do you want Braveheart to be the story of your life? That's it. You know, because really it's about being a revolution. That's what we're going to talk about. Now, the key part of every revolution is a revolutionary understands what is and then what ought to be. So you imagine it's in simple things, parents have a dream. They think, you know what, I can create a perfect birthday party for my kids and I can create this beautiful cake, you know, and there's the dream, you know, this is what ought to be. And then this is what actually happens. And then, you know, they say, no, I can do these cookies, you know, with this beautiful cookies. And then there's the dream. They want to create a picture for their child. You know, I can take it. I don't have to hire a photographer. I can create this beautiful moment. And that's the reality. You know, I kind of nailed it. You know, I just had it perfect, right? See, we all have in our minds what could be, what should be, what ought to be. But we know we live in the land of is, what is. But we're always compelled when a revolutionary captures our imagination. Martin Luther King Jr., when he stood at the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, he talked about what is. He said, you know, Mississippi is sweltering in the heat of injustice and bigotry. Alabama, there's just injustice and police brutality. But he, talk about, he talked about what ought to be. Mississippi sweltering in the heat of bigotry could one day be an oasis of justice that the children growing up in the playgrounds of America would not be judged by the color of their skin, but the content of their character. And he galvanized a nation because he talked about what ought to be. That's what revolutionaries do. Abraham Lincoln, he talked about a nation. He said, you know, this is a cancer in our soul, slavery. It's wrong. And he dreamed about a country where everybody would be equal. And Again, galvanized nation. And so that's what is powerful about a revolutionary. And so when we talk about fearless, you know, all of these people that we're giving to, these are people that are powerful visionaries that see the way the world is, but they go, it can't be this way. One of the organizations we gave to, you know, they see in the two thirds world so many cripples that live in the dirt and have no dignity. And their mission is the idea of, that this shouldn't be, that every person should have a wheelchair so they have mobility. See, it should be, it should be. Others of you get involved into the, you know, where, where kids, they're not even known, their names aren't even said, and they're in institutions, uh, they're in group homes in the foster care system. And there's a whole bunch of you that say, these kids should have honor, they should have value. They shouldn't be forgotten. They shouldn't drop through the cracks. And so you get involved in there, you minister and create camps and be a part of their lives because they can't be. Even those that I went and served, just the, we um, served food in Santa Ana because there's a group of people that said, people shouldn't go to bed hungry. They shouldn't do that. And so they're there and they serve meals Every day you can go and serve with them. And not only that, they have, you know, give them basic medical care. And they also now are offering legal care because many of them are there and on the streets because they have a legal problem and they can't figure out how to solve it themselves. But their whole goal is to get them to the Orange County Rescue Mission where they can get job training and they can get a new start in life because it shouldn't be this way. You see, that's what captures. That's what makes a revolution is somebody saying, I know what is and that's what Jesus does. Today, what we're going to see is how Jesus understands the way the world is. It's broken. There's injustice, cruelty, hatred. But it shouldn't be that way. And he talks in this passage we're going to look at, look at today about the way things are meant to be. The way you were designed to live. And so you're going to be invited to be a part of this revolution. So you can see we're going to look at Jesus, the revolutionary, the message of the revolution, and then people's response. All right? So pull out your outlines, and that's where we're going to go. 
First of all, who is Jesus? Jesus is a revolutionary. And he begins his revolution, but specifically, Luke introduces us to Jesus. He tells us who he is. So if you've got your Bibles, by the way, all of you that have your Bible, blessings on you. I love you more than the rest of the room. And I pray for you that your food will taste better and your families will love you more. Blessings to you. Those of you that have, you have to wait to the end of the service for a blessing. And the reason is, is I want you to, you know, like, for instance, this passage, if you had a Bible, you could mark it because this is the cry, the rebels yell of the revolution. You want to remember this so that you have your Bible. So Luke chapter 4. Here it is. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And news about him spread through the whole countryside. He's famous. He was teaching in the synagogues and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth. What's Nazareth? It's the place that he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue as was his custom. He stood up to read and the scroll of the prophet was handed to him. Why didn't they hand him the book of Isaiah? Because they didn't have books back then. They only had scrolls, right? They handed him the uh, scroll that Isaiah was written on and unrolling it, he found the place where it was written. So we'll cover the rest in a second. So here's who Jesus is. We see Jesus at his baptism, anointed by the Holy Spirit. God the Father announces, this is my loved son who I am so proud of. He goes into the wilderness. He's tempted and he demonstrates his power over evil, showing that we don't have to fall. Sin is no longer our master. Now he's traveled around the whole area and he's healed people. He's powerful. He's been teaching. Now he has this homecoming. He comes to his hometown. What's that going to be like? What's it like when you come back to your hometown? And he's coming back as a revolutionary, talking about this revolution, what's going to happen. So he's teaching with authority. Now, what happens is Jesus goes to the synagogue. You know that the temple in those days were the center of Jewish worship. But that was a long distance away, so there were synagogues, like local churches in every town. And a synagogue was a place you connected with God, connected in God's community. You learned God's word. You discovered your purpose for life. So when a synagogue met, they would have a liturgy and they would start their services by everyone would stand and they would uh, repeat, they would um, declare together the Shema, which is in Deuteronomy 6. And you know, it, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And when we read over uh, families, when they're dedicating their children and teach your children these words as you go on your way and all that, that's the Shema. So they would together recite the Shema. Then there would be prayers. Then there, someone would stand and read from the Torah, the first five books of the Bible that Moses wrote. Then a, prophet, uh, a rabbi would stand and read from the uh, prophets. And then there would be a teaching. And the teacher, you would stand when you read God's word, but the teacher would sit when he taught God's word. And at the end, there would be worship, uh, benediction, and people would leave. So that's what is going on. So when Jesus... Uh, reads this, this is what he says. So it says, Jesus standing, he reads, and it says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Now, why? This is Isaiah chapter 61. Why is Jesus going to read Isaiah's passage? Because this is the message of the revolution. So this is what Jesus is saying. This, I am this revolution. This is the message of what I'm all about. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. Where is this out of? Isaiah 61, good, just want to pay attention. The spirit of the Lord is, uh, is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and the recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. You want to underline that. Then he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and he sat down. Why is he going to sit down? Because that's what you did when you taught in a synagogue. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began, he begins his whole message by saying this. Today, not tomorrow, not in the near future. Today, this scripture is being fulfilled in your hearing. He's saying to them something that's absolutely amazing. He's saying this passage. Now, why is this passage so powerful? If you go back into Isaiah 61, 
the topic title above Isaiah 61 would say the year of the Lord, or it would actually say uh, the year of the Lord's favor, or in many Bibles it would say the Messiah's Jubilee. So you need to understand what the word Jubilee is because that's really what he's talking about and he's saying it's happening right now. So what is Jubilee? Well, when we think about Jubilee, we think of an anniversary sale, you know, the 10th Jubilee sale, come get your large screen TV, right? Or, you know, cars are at half price. But that's not biblically what Jubilee is. Jubilee is an awesome term. You know, term. Do you know what it means? I'll show you what it means. In the Old Testament, God established the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day, you were to work six days, and on the Sabbath day, you were to rest. It was a way of saying, God, I trust you. I will work hard six days, but I will, on, I will trust you to supply everything I need, and I will honor you. I will remember you. I will reflect on you. One day dedicated to the Lord. Not only were you supposed to take one day out of seven, there was supposed to be a Sabbath year. Look at what it says in Exodus 23. For six years, you are to sow your fields and harvest the crops. But during the seventh year, let the land lie unplowed and unused. Then the poor may get food from it. Do the same with your vineyard and your olive grove. So he said, on the seventh year, let the land provide for you. It's a, a picture of how I will take care of you and provide for you. Six years, work the land. The seventh year, let it go. And the, what grows will take care of. I'll provide for you. And I'll also provide for the poor. So you rest in the Lord. Then... There was the year of Jubilee, which was the 50th year. In Leviticus 25, it said, count off seven Sabbath years, seven times seven years to a period of 49 years. And then on the 50th year, he's saying, have the trumpet sounded everywhere. So let's blare the trumpet. Can you make the sound of a trumpet? All right. So everybody, trumpet blast. Okay, just go loud. Okay, that might be better. Everybody, loudest trumpet you can make. <laughs> That's terrible. All right, but be ready for that. Okay, be ready. Here it comes. And on the, <laughs> for funny years. Then have the trumpet sounded everywhere. <laughs> it's really good. And on the 10th day of the seventh month, on the day of atonement, consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all of its inhabitants, it shall be a jubilee for you. So the 50th year is a year of jubilee. Now what happened in the year of jubilee? This is what would happen if we read more of the passage. The 50th year, all of the land was to return to its original owners. It was to restore order because the land belonged to God. And God said, when you go into the land, it belongs to me. He gave it to different families and he said, you can sell the land, but at every 50 years, and so when Jubilee would come around, you might, you, there might be a calamity in your family, you're, uh, a death of a father, and you might have to sell your land. might be 30 years in. So you would sell your land, but in 20 years, you would get it back. And so what it did is it restored order. There was no way that you would be oppressed. Land returned to the original families every 50th year. So there was a restoration. It was this claiming of victory. Not only that, if you occurred a debt, all debts were forgiven in the year of Jubilee. Could you imagine how great that would be? Jubilee, go to your bank and say, hey, it's done. I don't owe you anything. You don't owe anybody anything. So if you had incurred debts, there were two things. You could be put in prison until you could pay, or you would become an indentured servant. You were a slave. But at 50th year, everyone, all debts were canceled. All debtor prisons were set free. Everyone was let go. And so there is this powerful message. You imagine every 50th year, I want you to remember that I'm taking care of you. I'm watching out for you. 50 years, the land belongs to me. There is this announcement, release, freedom, forgiveness, all debts canceled, all land goes back to where, it, you know, to who owed it, who it belonged to. Now, how many years, this is, was announced Children of Israel are delivered out of the slavery of Egypt. They're in the wilderness. God says, when you go into the land, this is the way I want you to live. How many Jubilee years do you think Israel ever celebrated? None. They never celebrated a Jubilee year. And we know why, right? If I ask you, you go, oh, I know why that happens. Why? Because rich people don't give things back, right? 
You know, because what's the first word, one of the first words we all learn as children? <laughs> you know, all right? Let's say it with a little alacrity. What's one of the first words? Mine. And so when somebody, you know, bought land and the year came around and they, you were only supposed to owe it for 20 years or 30 years or whatever, and all of a sudden they were supposed to give it back, they said, mine. I'm not giving this back. I bought it. I'm going to owe it forever. And when you owed somebody money, what's the rule? If you owe, you pay, right? And so they're not going, hey, I want you money. I'm not forgiving that debt. So there's no record in the Bible that the children of Israel ever celebrated a jubilee year. But bigger than that, the concept of the Messiah's jubilee, they held on to. What did it mean? God was giving them this because he said one day the Messiah will come and he will establish the jubilee. It is a time of restoration. It's a time of order, of reestablishing. And all debts are forgiven. There's forgiveness. There is this proclamation. Freedom. There's sight to the blind. Good news to the poor. The release from the prisoner. This is the Messiah's jubilee. And it was a revolution for the whole person and the whole nation, the whole world. Some people think that this was a revolution just of a spiritual revolution where he'd come back and people would be made right with God. But it's more than just a spiritual deal. Some people think this message is just a social thing, that we'd go out and do good in Jesus' name. But that's not what the revolution is. The revolution is for the whole person. The Messiah's jubilee is going to come and he's going to transform the whole person, physical, spiritual, emotional, in every way. And he's going to transform the whole world. And he invites you to be a part of what God's doing in the world. You, he says, my people, not only, I will begin this, but my followers will become the trumpet blast. You are going to be the people who model, let's see when that fun, model jubilee to the world. You are going to live as people that are announcing good news, release this idea of re restoration. There is good news. You become the people of Jubilee, and that's the revolution that God invites you into, that Jesus invites you to be a part of. And it's a total person's transformation. Look at the state, the concept. Good news for the poor. It's we understand what spiritual poverty is. All of us have spiritual poverty. We were born uh, slaves to sin. We have built a mountain of moral debt. We could never pay back to God what we owe Him. But Jesus came and He went to the cross. And he paid our debt so that we can be forgiven. The debt is canceled so that God not only forgives us, but he makes us rich in every way. He gives us his spirit, his family, truth to live by, people to live with. We are God's loved children. And as a result, we become spiritually wealthy. But it's not just a spiritual wealth. It is literally people who are economically impoverished because as a part of Jesus's Revolution, He says, my people are going to go into the world and because I have made them rich spiritually, they automatically are going to be people who are generous. Not just sort of generous, they're going to be radically generous. And they're going to share with those who don't have any because they understand that they have been given to. So my revolution will be a physical revolution or an economic revolution. It'll be a revolution to help people who are, who are poor emotionally, who are poor physically, who are impoverished in any way. And that's what we do in Fearless. We go out and we help people who are poor physically, poor emotionally, poor, you know, in their money. We feed them. We take care of them. We try to help them get jobs, job training, all of those things, because that's what God's people do. That's what it means to be part of the revolution. We give good news to the poor, right? You don't sound like you're excited about it. You sound like you just want a life of mind-numbing mediocrity. You want, you know, is that what you want? Just a mind-numbing kind of the romantic novel? No, you're not called to that. You're called to live out a Braveheart kind of life, to transform your life, to transform the whole world through you. That's what Jesus is saying. The second thing he says is to release the captive. We understand what it means to be you know, to owe somebody, to be in debt monetarily. But that's not even the worst kind of captivity. The worst kind of captivity is when we fail, we hurt someone, we're locked up because we need forgiveness. And Jesus gives us forgiveness. And so what is the rebel's yell that we offer to everyone? 
forgiveness. We move into a world and Jesus forgave us, so people hurt us, they bump us, they cause pain to us, and yet we extend forgiveness to them. We've talked about that for, before, because that is the rebel jail. I will forgive you because Jesus forgave me. C.S. Lewis says, forgiveness is a lovely idea until you have to do it. But you see, we become, we are the trumpet blast. We are the people who model jubilee to the world because we extend forgiveness to people. We live it out in the world. We release the captives. We pray over people who are spiritually oppressed. One of the things that we did when we fed uh, the people in Santa Ana as the leader of the group said, be sure and pray for them because prayer is powerful and prayer can release these people from the, the captivity that they find themselves in. And we prayed over them and as different volunteers, we prayed for the different people that we talked to because we believe that Jesus will use that prayer and transform people's lives. Do you believe that? That's right. That's what he's about. Because we are part of a revolution that transforms lives and transforms the world. Then the recovery of sight. And that's for sure physical sight. And we see Jesus literally healing people. So they restored their physical sight in his life. But there's, you know, and physically some of you are involved in that as you give medical clinics and being part of extending God's grace that way. But sight spiritually, you know, we're blind. We don't even understand who God is. And so we try to restore spiritual sight so people can see who God is, who Jesus is, and how relationships can be healed. But even beyond that, we want people to understand what it means to have a vision for their life. Helen Keller, famous woman, said, there is something worse than being born blind. It is a person who is born with sight, but has no vision for their life. And there are so many people who live with no sense of vision for their own life. And Jesus wants to restore sight to people who've lost the sense of how God called them and why God called them. We're going to have the dream event in next week or week after next, where we're going to talk about discovering God's purpose for your life again. Talking Because every year we want to make sure that you're discovering the unique call that God has for your life. We want to help restore vision. That's what, God's, what Jesus is doing. And then freedom for the oppressed. We get oppressed by things in our lives, spiritual oppression. There's oppression. We get addicted to things. Next week, we're going to see how Jesus demonstrates the power of his revolution as he frees someone who is spiritually oppressed. So you want to be here because it talks, lots of us get oppressed spiritually. And How is it that we experience the kind of freedom that God wants to give to us? But what the point of this is, is Jesus is saying this, you... As you are my followers, you get to be the people who are the trumpet blast. You go out into the community and you go, ah. you announce this is the time of the Messiah's jubilee. You live a life that is restoring, that brings freedom, not only in your own life that is good news for the poor, but you extend that every place that you go. And so Jesus understands what the world is. He says, I get that there's hatred and oppression and injustice. There's racism and sexism. I get that that's what the world is. But he says, but what I'm doing is I am bringing beauty and order and love and restoration and healing and sight. And everyone that is a part of my work, you're a part of my revolution. And you are restoring individuals' lives and I'm transforming them and I'm transforming the world. That's the work that Jesus invites you in every day. Do you want a mind-numbing, mediocre life? Or you want the adventure that Jesus is inviting you in? At the end of your life, what do you really want to look back on? Lay in your deathbed and go, man, I lived a mind-numbing, mediocre life. Mine was a romance novel. Or do you want to say, I wrote the brave heart of my life? Really, what do you want? Jesus says, come join me in the revolution. You know, what's amazing is Jesus reads Isaiah 61. He cuts out the very last part of it. He says, this is the time of the Messiah's Jubilee. And the very next line, it's on the bottom of your outline. And it says, not just the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. Why did Jesus leave off the day of vengeance? It's what everybody wanted. 
Everybody in Jesus' day wanted vengeance. They wanted a Messiah who would come and bring vengeance on their enemies, who would destroy the power of Rome, who would judge the sin of other people, not their sin, but the judge of other, of other people's sin. They wanted vengeance. Why doesn't Jesus read that line? Did Jesus come to bring condemnation? Did Jesus come to bring the vengeance of God? No, he didn't. How do you know that? Are you just going to spin that off and say, well, because that's the right answer? Okay, here's how you know it. John 3, 16, you all know this verse. But it's all contained in John 3, 17. John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Whoever believes in him will have everlasting life. What's John 3, 17? God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Jesus did not come to bring vengeance and condemnation. He came to bring grace. Jesus will come back again, and at some point he'll make things right, and there will be judgment. But in his first coming, he's coming to save and rescue. He said, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. What kind of people would want vengeance on their enemies? You wouldn't want that, would you? See, Jesus said, that's not what I came. In fact, later he's going to talk about what does it mean to love your enemies. That's what it means to be part of the revolution, to extend grace and mercy. And so Jesus, you know, the surprise is Jesus comes with this compelling message. Here's the revolution. And it's a message of restoring and freedom and life and good news. And you know what's amazing? The people in Nazareth miss the whole message and they miss being part of the revolution. They didn't join it and they missed it totally. And the surprise to me is some of you are still going to miss it. People missed it then, and people still miss it today. Why did they miss it? Because it's the same reason some of us will miss it today. Look at what it says in Luke 22. It says, all spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. But then they go on and they say, but isn't this Joseph's son, they ask? See, Jesus is coming and he's saying, here's a revolution. It's going to transform people. It's going to transform the whole world. And people are looking and saying, that's a great, that's a great, great revolution. But didn't we play t-ball together as kids? You know, <laughs> didn't, didn't our kids play, you know, my kids played soccer with you, Jesus. Slow down. You know, you're just Jesus. You know, I saw you when you were a little kid. You're just, you're just Jesus. See, they didn't see Jesus as the son of God powerful, almighty God who could transform a life and could tr transform the world. They saw him as little baby Jesus. Did you see the movie Talladega Nights with Will Ferrell? <laughs> Remember in the movie, he prays and he says, I like to pray to my little baby Jesus and his little baby crib and little baby. And you know, while that was kind of startling, I thought, when I saw that, I thought, you know what, that's what I do sometimes when I pray. See, I like little baby Jesus. I like a Jesus that's small, that's comfortable, that's not going to invade my life and not demand anything of me. Jesus isn't a little baby Jesus. He's the son of God who went and conquered sin and death on the cross. And when I look at my own prayer life and I think Jesus came to transform my life and to transform the world and my prayer life is my knees hurt. Could you fix it? And this bothers me. And you know, and and, and and it isn't that God doesn't care about all that, uh, uh, but, but there aren't these powerful, majestic prayers of God, would you transform and change me? Would you transform my city? Would you transform our church? Would you transform the world? And would you use us, God? Would you use us? It's not a little baby Jesus prayer. And the reason they missed the revolution is they went, well, hey, it's just Jesus. It's just Jesus. The second reason they miss, and some of us will miss Jesus for the same reason. The second reason is because they said, well, you're going to have to prove it to me, Jesus. You're going to have to do some big miracle. You know, prove that you're really the Messiah. You know, do, you know I, I need a miracle in my life. Jesus said to them, surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. And you will tell me, do here in our, your hometown what, you, what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. Truly, I tell you, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. Saying, some of you are going to come and say, hey, if you're the big Messiah, going to transform people's lives, transform the world, 
We heard how you healed people. We want to see the healing. We've heard how you've done these big... You've got to do a miracle. If you do a big miracle, then I'll believe in you. And when you look at the whole story arc of Jesus' life, never does he respond to someone who says, prove yourself. Jesus has done enough to prove himself. But every person who comes to Jesus in humility and surrender, saying, I am undone. And could you help? Would you help? I have no one but you. Over and over again, you see Jesus healing and saving and rescuing. There is only one path to Jesus. Total humility and desperate dependence. And he never responds to a person. You know, if you're a seeker and you're trying to find Jesus and your attitude is if he'd just prove himself to me, if he would just do this miracle, that is not the path to Jesus. You will never find him. There has to be a place where we humbly surrender ourselves and say, I am desperate. Without you, I can't live. I can't make it. I have no hope. I can't forgive myself. I can't surrender. God, you, only you, only you, Jesus. It's the only path to find Jesus. And then the third reason that people miss Jesus, and this one's unbelievable. They said, well, if you're not, and it goes, if you're not for us, or if we're not in, then you're the wrong Messiah. You see, we're kind of pre-qualified, Jesus. We're, we're Americans. We're sitting in church. We've done things. And see, they thought, well, we're the Israelites. We're special people. We're pre-qualified for your grace. So if you're not accepting us, if you're not going to do what we want, if you're not going to bring vengeance, if you're not about my agenda, then you are the wrong Messiah. And Jesus gives two powerful illustrations from the Old Testament of a time when God saved and rescued and delivered people that were not God's people. And this was crazy thinking to those people because they just assumed the Messiah's Jubilee is going to show up. He's going to work in my life. It's going to be for my benefit. Things are going to be my way. And he's saying, that's not the way it works. God only responds to courageous faith. Only those who are going to take, take God at his word, believe what he said. He only works in their life. So look at the two illustrations that he gives them. I assure you that there were many widows. How many widows? Many. And where were they? In Israel. So there are many widows in Israel. Many in Elijah's time. But he didn't work in their life. And when the sky was shut for three and a half years, and there was a severe famine throughout the whole line, yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Seraphath in the region of Sidon. The story is this woman was a widow. She had just a son. Elijah shows up and he says, will you feed me? She goes, I only have enough for one last meal, but I'll share it with you. And so she makes one last meal and she goes, and then we'll die, I guess. So she shares her meal with Elijah, her son and her, and she thinks she's going to die. And yet God supplied food for her for three and a half years in the most severe famine in the land because of her courageous faith. Her son died. Elijah raised him from the dead because of her courageous faith. God worked in her life because she had a courageous faith. There were many widows in Israel, but he didn't go to them. Because they did not believe. They said, God, you have to show up on my terms. And he tells a second story. And there were many in Israel. How many? That had what? With leprosy. How many people in, le had leprosy in Israel? Many. In the time of Elisha, the prophet. Yet none of them were cleansed. Only Naaman, the Syrian. Syrian was a general in an army that was against Israel. But God healed him because, again... His courageous faith. He did what God asked him to do. And the point is in this passage where he's talking to these people. He says, you know what? You, you want, you're looking for a God who's going to do what you want him to do instead of responding in faith. You see, the revolution, it requires a lot of us. And some of us are going to miss the revolution because we just want a nice life. We want comfort. We want God on our terms. We want God to do things our way. We want a mind-numbing, mediocre life. And God says, you're on your own for that. But if you're willing to step out in courageous faith and follow me, you can change the world and be a part of what I'm doing. But you're going to have to be a person of faith. And what's amazing is the people didn't want it. Here, Jesus is saying, jubilee, sound the trumpet. You be the trumpet that sounds Good news, restoration, freedom, release, forgiveness. And they didn't want it. 
And they were so angry, they actually wanted to kill Jesus. It says all the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up and drove him out of the town and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he, he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. He said, not today. See, no one ever took Jesus' life. He surrendered it. But today he said, this is not my time. Imagine the power of God and Jesus. They all want to kill him. They are furious. They want to throw him off. Just not today. Not going to happen today. And he walks through them. It says in another part of the Bible, Jesus didn't do anything miraculous or powerful in Nazareth because of their unbelief. They just wouldn't respond and they missed the revolution. So my question to you as we finish, you want to be a part of the revolution? I mean, really? Because it demands a lot of you. But it is the most inspiring and exciting thing that God came to do through Jesus. And he says he wants to invite you to be part of it. When you look back on your life, what do you want to look back on? This great adventure where you were a part of what God was doing. So what does it mean to be a revolutionary? First, for those of you that are seekers, how do you find Jesus? How do you meet Jesus? Total surrender. You got to say, God, I can't. I can't make it on my own. I can't fix myself. I need you. You can't say, prove to me. Prove to me. You got to say, God, you have proven. Your Bible has given a record of all of these miracles. I don't need to see one more miracle. And if you do, you, know, you say, I believe. Because belief is a critical part. Secondly, it means that we have to live the way that God calls. We know what the land of is is like, but we know what should be. We know what ought to be. We live in a world where there's brokenness and pain and sadness. People hurt each other and they, they have resentment and pain and they never release each other for the personal debt. There's no forgiveness in the world. But we know the way it should be. And we are the trumpet blast. We are the people of Jubilee. We are the people who have been forgiven. And so we move into a world and we announce this is the time of the Messiah's Jubilee. This is the good news. I will forgive you because I have been forgiven. How could I not? Forgiveness is the rebel's yell. Where we move into a world and we demonstrate through our lives God's grace. We bring the revolution and we demonstrate the transformation in our life. We understand what ought to be. We know what is when it comes to relationships. What is the most powerful way? We just did a series on relationships and marriage. What's the most powerful way you're going to demonstrate that this is the Messiah's jubilee in your marriage? When you have a loving marriage where you're willing to serve your spouse and serve your family and be a person of love. We understand what is, people just drifting, there's no love, just sort of get along, not really working hard, no date light, nights, no excitement in your marriage. But we know what ought to be. It should be beauty and love, be self-giving and selfless. That's what God calls us to do. And you become a revolutionary when you say, I will love my spouse. Husbands, when you say, I will love my wife as Christ loved the church, you women will say, I'm going to love my husband, like the church, is called to love Jesus. That is a powerful rebel yell. And then when we move out and we serve the world like Jesus served, we serve with the heart of Jesus, the poor, the marginalized, the forgotten. We announce this is the year. This is the time of the Messiah's Jubilee. And we help those who are poor spiritually, those who are poor economically, those who are locked up in jails and in prison of their own making because of guilt and shame, the things that they've done, when we get involved in their lives, when we help those that are oppressed, we are a part of announcing the good news. I mean, we're part of the revolution. Easter's coming. The resurrection is the dominant story because it proves that Jesus is who he says and we're going to get together and celebrate the cross on Good Friday, the resurrection on the, all of our Easter services. And you have the opportunity to go into your hometown and announce this is good news. Good news to those who are poor, to the oppressed, to those who are locked up. We get to announce the good news. We get to invite our friends 
to Easter and experience the freedom. And we get to be not just sort of generous. We get to be radically generous because we understand that God owns everything. And we get to be a part of the work that he's doing in the world. And when we give, we say, this world does not own me and things do not owe me. And I will not trust in money and wealth, which is so insecure, but I will trust in a God who is absolutely secure. And you live in a land that absolutely grabs a hold of wealth and say, it's the only thing trustworthy. And so you with the rebel shall say, no, God and God alone is who I trust in. And you are part of the revolution. So my question is, you going to join the revolution? Yeah. Are you going to just live a mind-numbing, mediocre life? Will you bow your heads, close your eyes? And let me just ask you this as we close. What would it mean for you to join the revolution? What would you have to let go of? What would have to change in your thinking? In your mindset, you know, do you think that your life is just about your comfort, your security? You have to change the way you think to be a part of a revolution, to live this daring adventure of faith. What would have to change in your life? Father, would you speak to us now? This moment might be the only moment of quiet that we have all week. We so much need to hear from your spirit. Speak to your children right now. Would you encourage and affirm them as your loved children? Father, would you challenge them to step out? You're a trustworthy God that's good. And the plans that you have for them are good plans to bring about hope and to restore, to rebuild, to be a part of the great work that you're doing. Father, draw us to you. 